World War One was apparently the war to end all wars. That couldn't have been a more incorrect statement, but Tannenberg was recently free on the Epic Store and like the lazy piece of shit that I am, I bought it full price on Steam. But the World War One game series and Beyond the Wire aren't that popular. They see significantly less player counts than other games released around the same time. However, these games are World War II games, which admittingly is a more popular war. The antagonist and protagonist were much easier to follow. The plot line was a lot more simpler in my opinion. But from a historical point of view, I'd say the idea of trench warfare using bolt action weapons, swords, some really funky looking weapons, I can imagine that it would be a turn off for a lot of people, but I'm curious, why do you like World War II over World War One? But what is Tannenberg? It is a first person shooter set in World War One, more specifically the Battle of Tannenberg, which happened on the Eastern Front between the Germans and the Russians. So you won't be seeing the British or the French in this game. However, you will be seeing some lesser known countries, lesser known in my opinion countries that I didn't learn about in high school, but you have the Latvians, the Romanians, and Bulgarians. And one of my favorite major countries that you can play as is Austria-Hungary, as um, you can play as the cuck unit. But Austria-Hungary were the ones that more or less initiated World War One. But leading up to this, the Archduke decided to drive around in a somewhat hostile environment, and he ended up having a bomb thrown at his car. So of course, they decided to drive home, but the motorcade that he was in took a wrong turn. And as his driver is like trying to chuck a Yui, for some plot-related reasons, one of his assassins was at a cafe right as his car stopped, and the rest is history. But in the game, you have four on top factions, and three great power factions, each with their own weapons, uniforms, that would have been used around this time period. There are no LMGs, except for the mounted ones throughout the map, and this is because apparently LMGs weren't used that much here, or at all, apparently, and snipers are also not in this game. But the way the weapons handle and the map sizes, any gun can really be a sniper if you sit close enough to your monitor, but more on that later. But each faction get four classes that vary in weapons and special abilities, you have your N NCOs who can call in artillery, recon, and even chemical weapons. There's a war crime for everyone in this game. You know, you have the basic tear gas and chlorine gas, which apparently the French were the first to use tear gas in World War One. which, you know, use of chemical weapons, not okay, but, you know, kudos to the French for, you know, not resorting to some pretty other heinous types of gas that we're about to talk about. But you also have phosgene gas, I think that's how you pronounce it, which can cause suffocation by reacting with proteins in your lungs, and is also responsible for around 85% of gas-related deaths during the Great War. But you also have mustard gas, which sounds horrific because it can cause burns upon contact with your skin. But there's one country, I'm not gonna name names, but they have a long track record of using chemicals for uh, nefarious reasons. But in all seriousness, in the game, all these types of gas are mitigated when you use a gas mask that is available to everyone. The cool thing is your vision is different depending on what mask you use. You can't pick and choose which mask you want to use, but they are relevant to the country that you're playing as. When chemical weapons are used, it does change the pace of the game in a certain area of the map a little bit, because you can't actually see where you're going, and you need to navigate trenches or an objective site with care. But what game modes do you have to play with? You have maneuver, attrition, and rifle deathmatch, but you only really are going to be playing the first, and similar to conquest, supremacy, tack ops, it's not one-to-one -one similar, but it does follow the same formula and gameplay pattern. You have the map and need to capture points. The more control points you have, the faster the enemy's victory points will drain, and this will lead you to a win. You can try and cut them off, and even encircle one of the points, and that means they can't actually capture any objectives that are around that point unless it's connected to the main base. But the importance of these points is stressed more than other games, because you get access to special abilities on each point. Some give the recon ability, some have mounted machine guns, some can give you artillery strikes. I didn't really find the machine guns that useful because most of the time I just snuck around someone that was using them that had tunnel vision, but they do have their purposes. But moving on to bots, and this is due to the low player count of this game, if you play in Europe in prime hours, you can get a server or two that is full, so is the US region. Australia, you might be pushing it to get one full server with humans, but a fair amount of times bots do take the role of actual humans, and yes, they can play better than some of your teammates, or even the opposition who for some reason is just shit talking to a bunch 
bunch of bots. Like, I, I go and say something like, bro, like, half the server is human. Okay, calm down. But I, I'm myself, I'm no saint. I do participate in abusing games such as Battlebit when I'm drunk. Oi, don't swear, this is a children's server. Sir, please refrain, please refrain from swearing, otherwise I'm gonna have to report you to an admin. But the bots are fairly easy to deal with, and don't do anything that makes you want to throw your computer out because of how busted they are. Yeah, I'm looking at you ready or not, but some people debate that the bots aren't good and shouldn't be in Isonzo, and I kind of disagree, because sure, the bots aren't that smart, but I'd rather have the satisfaction of mowing a hundred bots down and killing the occasional real player here and there, opposed to playing on a server with 10 or less people who you might not even see a whole lot throughout the game. I do believe that adding bots does extend the life cycle of a game. I still play Red Orchestra 2 here and there with bots and they function much better than the ones in RS2. But in regards to overall communication, I need to say that I did start a little after it went for free on Epic Games and if you played RS2 when that went for free on Epic Games, you can imagine uh, what was happening around that time. But there's very little communication in this game, but you do get a squad bonus if you are close to your NCO. So the idea of ape strong together isn't actually a bad idea, but as long as you know where the NCO wants you to go, they can place markers and say, okay, go here and capture it. You do get bonus points for doing what you're told to do. I'd imagine it would have been different when it went into early access in 2017, but in terms of gameplay and how easy it is to get into, it's extremely easy and accessible. It isn't difficult like games such as Project Reality, but it isn't a game of Battlefield 1, and I would put it slightly slightly more to the left than Rising Storm 2 Vietnam, and this is some of the reasons why I also like Tannenberg. The first reason why I like it is the ease of getting into it. If you want to kill time or just want to hop into some quick action, this game delivers. It's not like Squad or Hell Let Loose, where you have to be more involved with the gameplay, such as constant communication, more punishing game mechanics such as long spawn times. In Tannenberg, you die, you can respawn in a couple of seconds on an objective or on a squad mate fairly quickly, unless of course the teams are unbalanced, then you might get a penalty applied to your spawn times. The maps are small. I did find some of the maps a little repetitive, but you have night, day, and snow maps, and sure, they aren't visually breathtaking, but they do look cool because you have modeled interiors, wounded soldiers placed throughout the map which can distract you, broken vehicles, artillery strikes, dead horses. The maps are based on real world locations, but you have varying types of areas. You have hilltops that can overlook a battlefield, you have dense forests, trenches, and large open fields, and usually trench warfare is associated with World War 1, and that is very apparent in a game such as Beyond the Wire, but in this game, trench warfare is there, but it's not a major component of the map styles. Movement is fast, and there is a stamina bar which is good, because it gets people to be a little smarter when they want to sprint. There is no vaulting or cover system, and the guns aren't laser accurate, but they have sway applied to them, especially after sprinting long distances. But the overall gun hand is just very simple and it's easy to get used to. It's not like Project Reality where it wants to take a more realistic approach by modeling in dispersion and you missing all your shots, especially after running extended distances. But this game is much more fast paced and you'll be able to land shots fairly easily even after you've ran for a long time. We also have to talk about the gore mechanics and they are pretty damn cool. If you get shot in the arm or leg, expect the limb to come off. Usually all it takes is one shot from any rifle for to kill you, two to three from pistols, but there's just something horrifying about killing someone and hearing them scream in pain, and it goes on for a long time. You can't put them out of their misery by shooting them in the head. It's similar to games like Insurgency Sandstorm, when you Molotov cocktail someone and you just put another bullet in their head. It feels like the humane thing to do, but in this game you have to sit there and listen to what you've done. Oh, and also heads can come flying off. I wouldn't say the gore is as traumatizing as World at Wars, but the gore mechanics in this game are good. But the thing is, you're not getting a Battlefield 1 experience where everyone will have SMGs or LMGs and you're gonna have planes 
means dive bombing every now and then. Sure, the gameplay in Tannenberg is fast and easy to get into, but you play with historically accurate uniforms and weapons that make you get into that World War One mindset. But nonetheless, I do have a lot of fun playing this game. I'd say it's a little bit more on the underrated side, but I do understand why people don't play it anymore, and it's starting to age a little bit. I'd say worse than RS2 Vietnam. I understand that it's an indie dev and they're a small company, so I'm not gonna knock it too hard. But some of the animations are pretty good, especially when it comes to reloading, but you can cancel them fairly quickly and reload a lot quicker. And the game can feel a little janky here and there. But nonetheless, I had a lot of fun playing this, and I did get recommended this uh, a long time ago, and I'm glad that I eventually got the chance to play it. But if you want to see my Verdun video, which is just terrible, it's a terrible video. I don't really want you to watch it, but I have to tell you to watch it. So just click on the video that is on screen. Anyways, my name is Tan2 and I will catch you guys in the next video. Peace.